So um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Kent Holsinger, who's the professor of biology at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Connecticut. Um, his PhD is from Stanford, and I'm abbreviating his research interests, but they include plant population genetics and evolution, conservation biology, and molecular evolution. He has served as the executive vice president of the Society for the Study of Evolution and as president of the American Genetics Association, the American Institute of Biological Sciences, and the Botanical Society of America. Since 2000, he has chaired the Board of Directors of BioOne, a nonprofit journal aggregation committed to providing not for profit publishers with income to support their publishing activities at a price libraries can afford. Me too. Okay. Bye. Okay, Kent, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so I'm going to put your slides up. You've already been introduced, so we're ready to go. Okay, great. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you fine. Okay, go ahead and start. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I'm sorry not to be there in person, but I had a had another meeting that I just got out of 15 minutes ago. Um, and th thank you very much for the invitation, a uh, chance to say a little bit here about scholarly societies and open access. Since I haven't heard anything that other people said, I hope I don't repeat too much of what others have said. But let me just start with the next slide. Being in evolutionary biologist, um, I, I, I feel like I sort of have to st start with a little bit of history of where scholarly societies came from. And, it, and of course, the first one was the Royal Society of London, founded over 350 years ago, uh, with the purpose of discussing the new philosophy of promoting knowledge known as science. And if, if we go to the next slide, you can actually see the first page of the first issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, published in March of, of 1665. And you'll notice the, the first sentence there, I've pulled out just a, a phrase that, that says, there is nothing more important than communicating such things as are discovered. And that fundamentally, from the start, in my view, has been the foundation and purpose of scholarly societies to communicate what's discovered and to support their discovery. So if we go to the next slide then, uh, scholarly societies primarily communicate their work either through published journals, whether print or online, or through the scholarly meetings, like the, the, the one that's happening today, where individuals exchange their ideas. There are, of course, many scholarly meetings that aren't associated with societies, but but in, uh, in many fields of study, it's the scholarly societies and the meetings they sponsor that are some of the most important face-to-face -face interactions. But communicating scholarly work is not the only thing that scholarly societies do. And if we could go to the next slide, I've just pointed out a few of the things that many scholarly societies do, including the various societies that I've been affiliated with. So. Scholarly societies are interested not only in communicating their work among themselves and to a broader public audience, but also in supporting the development of young scholars, um, K through graduate education, both through outreach to those educational programs and small grants, and more broadly, developing s support for the field and providing feedback to society in ways that may help public policy to develop more broadly. All of that, including scholarly communication, of course, requires that the societies have some funds and revenues to support those operations. And so, on the next slide, I just point out that although the, the, the details of the sources of those uh, revenue streams would differ from one society to another society, broadly speaking, I think for most, if not all, scholarly societies, the sources of revenue could be broken down into the four categories I've got here. There would be dues that are what come from individual members. For those that have a publishing program, institutional journal subscriptions, um, and I break that out for a reason that will become obvious in the next slide. Um, 
grants on uh, from the government and private foundations, and then also some degree of private philanthropy and endowment. Different societies depend in differing degrees to um, for on all of those sources of revenue. And since I just recently stepped down as president of the Botanical Society of America, I thought I'd share with you sort of a sum, uh, that level of summary on the next slide for what this looks like for the Botanical Society of America. The Botanical Society of America is a, a sort of a smaller to moderate sized scientific society. It's certainly not, you know, the hundred of, hundreds of thousands of the American Physical Society, the American Chemical Society, or AAAS. But it's larger than, than many other more specialized societies. It has on the order of about 3,500 to 4,000 members. And as you can see here, the breakout of the income stream is that of the revenue, a little more than half of it actually comes from institutional journal subscriptions. And it's important for me to note, point out here that 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 not only is that a major source of income for the society, but that's in spite of the fact that the annual subscription rate for the, Botani for the American Journal of Botany, which is the Botanical Society's journal, is less than $700 a year for institutions, which is only about half of that of comparable uh, journals coming from commercial publishers. The Botanical Society of America is, uh, in fact, self-published. And so it, pro it provides um, uh, an excellent high quality journal that was that was ranked as one of the ten most important scientific journals in, of the last century at a relatively modest price and even so that journal income is is vital to the operations of the society providing more than half of the income another another thing I think that's important to understand in terms of the scholarly society context here um, is that for any nonprofit publisher if we uh, look on the next page the reviewers for the articles that appear in the journal are generally unpaid. There are a few exceptions, but in general, reviewers of scholarly articles are unpaid. The editors for many journals, um, society journals, are either unpaid or receive only a nominal stipend. And by nominal, I mean they might receive, in extreme cases, perhaps as much as ten or fifteen thousand dollars in the smaller societies that I've been associated with. Rarely, and only with major journals like Science or Nature or the Journal of the Car American Chemical Society, would they actually receive a stipend sufficient to relieve them of substantial responsibilities to their institution. And perhaps most importantly of all, with respect to the revenue necessary f uh, to support just a publishing program, is that even if scholarly societies and scholarly publishers move entirely to online publication and obviously online publication is becoming increasingly important still only about 30 percent of the cost I just realized there's a typo, typo here only about 30 of the percent of the cost would be removed if print ones were, were no longer present so about 70 percent of the cost will be incurred regardless of whether a print journal is produced or not. What that means is that for scholarly societies and nonprofit publishers in general to continue to produce the content, that revenue has to come from somewhere. And so that that becomes the challenge then with open access publishing. Um, which I'll, and since that's the focus, I, I, I will get to that just actually on the last slide when I, when I say a, a bit more broadly. But I wanted to move on and just in, in the transition to point out that there are intermediate models. Um, the next slide describes very briefly another organization I've been involved with over the last decade. That is Bio One, uh, which it, many of you may know is a non not-for-profit uh, uh, online journal aggregator that pulls together um, journals published by a ver many different not-for-profit publishers worldwide uh, and distributes online, ver makes online versions of them available to libraries for a fee, but it, s it seeks simultaneously to provide substantial income to publishers to continue to support their publishing operations and uh, their other society activities, but to do so at a price that's fair and affordable to libraries. It also includes 12 open access titles where 
publishers have decided they want to make their their access their journals freely available, and BioOne provides the platform for them to do so. So, app open to access then. Uh, in my view, is clearly consistent with the mission of scholarly societies because the mission of scholarly societies is to disseminate the data and information and insights and knowledge that members of scholarly societies and other professionals in the field produce as widely as, as possible. And the challenge then is to determine who will pay for the cost of publication and also for many societies it goes beyond simply supporting the society's publishing program, but all and also helping to make sh helping the society to continue to do the other things that are necessary for the health of the field that it represents. And so there's this challenge of, of paying for publication and other society activities for organizations that in general provide good value for the money. And open access may be a way to do that if it's possible to pay the costs up front. That has the advantage of making the material then available to anyone who wants it without a paywall, without a subscription. The, the danger or the thing that the that many scholarly societies fear is that by making their publications open to all without subscription, that the the revenue on which they depend for their livelihood, both for continued publication and for the health of the disciplines they represent, is endangered. And balancing the, the goal of broad dissemination with the need for revenue to support that dissemination and the health of the societies is, I think, a real challenge for us all, but one that we need to work on together. And that's um, all I had to say, and I, I, I'll stay on the line for the discussion, which I understand is, is to follow now. Thanks very much.